And yeah, I'm going to be looking at the uh, distribution centre of the near future. Um, as Mark, well, we'll be looking through different, different areas. I won't in any way be able to cover all the technology. There's so much out there. I could quite easily spend half a day or a full day talking about different technologies that are in development, going to be developed. But I've sort of tried to focus on storage, internal transport, palletization and picking, because they're the, a lot of the cost elements. I've not actually focused on return logistics, but uh, like Mark said, it is relatively technology light because of the difficulty in handling. You don't know what you're going to be getting. So um, just looking at uh, that, and if we have time at the end, I'll just run through what is needed to make a successful automation project. So I'm Mike Vernon, as uh, Mark's already introduced me, so that's, that's me. I design automated systems, that's, that's my key role, and I'm very lucky that I really enjoy it. Um, I've, yeah, don't want to say how long I've been working, but uh, at least 35 years, so um, yeah. Uh, and uh, I've been heavily involved with the Automated Handling System Association, AMSA, um, which is a body of about 60 uh, manufacturing companies in the UK, some of whom are represented here today. Um, and uh, all the automate system integrators, conveyor manufacturers, through to waste scale companies, vision systems, uh, even installation companies are represented in the association. Um, uh, so I've been quite heavily involved with that. The, the BMHF um, is a federation of several different, many of you may know IPATH if you work at height, if you use um, dock levelers you'll know ALEM um, and loading ramps. Um, Construction Equipment Association is your big diggers, uh, your Komatsus and Volvos and Caterpillars, JCB. Um, but we all have to get to FEM to, to set the guidelines for Europe, Europe wide to oversee the CE marking of equipment and all sorts of things like that. So BMHF is like a conduit for these organisations to then go to product groups. So there's a whole organisation that you don't particularly see. Um, so for my sins, I've, uh, I'm president of, of that association as well. And I joined uh, Kuno Nagel full-time last year. Prior to that, I worked for them as a consultant for several years, um, putting systems in for them. Um, I'll just skip through just two or three slides about Kuna and Nagel, in case any of you don't know of us, but we're a worldwide company. Um, we've been, uh, I don't know how many countries we're in, but um, a lot of them, and we are uh, 65 countries. A few stats there for you, I'm not going to read them all out, um, but we, we specialise in sea freight, air freight, contract logistics, and overland, which is transport to and from Europe. Um, within the contract logistics uh, um, sector, which is which is who I, who I work for, um, um, in, in in the deep operation of DCs, uh, we're, we're still world, we're a worldwide organisation. Some more stats for you. Um, uh, and within the UK, uh, we focus on um, certain market sectors. So we don't do fashion. Um, for instance, um, but we, we do do some very specific things, so drinks logistics is a very big one for us, um, but then consumer retail, high tech, um, and then government and military. Uh, so that's, that's the introduction done. So why autonomous operations? Mark's already touched on it a little bit, but... Um, the labour shortage, um, certainly speaking as Kuna and Nagel, you know, the, the, the penny has, has finally dropped. That we just cannot go on with manual, pure manual warehouses. There just isn't the, the workforce around. For its sins, Kuna and Nagel is quite heavily invested in Milton Keynes. And from Milton Keynes south, we've got problems. Because we've got 185,000 jobs and we've got 169,000 people living in Milton Keynes who can work. 
So we're already, and this is last year's statistic, so last year 16,000 people were having to be bussed in. That's, that's a part, probably more than that because some of the people in Milton Keynes go to work in London or elsewhere, so it's a big problem. <clears throat> and then last month, bless them, Aldi and B&M announced that they're going to be building just across the road, across the M1, uh, and, and bringing in 1,400 more jobs. And they're not alone, there's a lot of other companies moving to the area. So you can see it's becoming a, a very acute problem. <clears throat> Fortunately, um, automation is really coming of age in terms of its flexibility, its system design. We'll be, we'll be looking at a, diff a few different technologies um, in the next few minutes. Um, and that's going to really uh, make the solutions that are available um, suited to an increasing number of tasks within the distribution centre. So, let's look at storage. We're, we're going to be looking at the trends. So, what are the trends? Floor land is going to be a problem. So, the demand to build higher is going to be there, build denser, get more pallets in the same space, uh, and to automate. So in terms of um, what we can do, to build high, 45 metres is now possible with crane systems. Um, several crane manufacturers can go to that height, which is um, well worthwhile. Now, it's not new, well 45 metres is quite new, 40 metres has been around for a number of years, um, but it just keeps going up. So in the UK, Kimberley Clark have got two 40 metre warehouses, Quinn Radiators 40 metres, Britvic are currently building in, Rugby, in the middle of Rugby a 40 metre warehouse in Swift Valley. Uh, they're actually digging down to get to that height, it's worthwhile digging down albeit into a hillside, but to, to get to that height. So the demand for um, using the height is, um, is, is growing and will continue to grow. But the automation is there to give us that capability. Um, so how to get denser uh, or more dense storage? Um, again, it's not a new technology but because the demand is now there and the technology is developed, so shuttle systems have been around for 20 years, but the, the differences now are we've got lithium-ion batteries, which makes the whole thing a lot more flexible because then rather than having to be hardwired, which they were previously, off a crane, they can now be handled by a reach truck or a V&A truck to be moved around. So for those people that haven't got a huge system, it could still be worthwhile. And we've got three projects that we're looking at at the moment within KN for pallet shuttle storage. And it gives roughly a 40 to 50% density increase in the store. With crane systems, you can go to 45 meters high. So you've got a lot of advantages of it. Of course, it's more expensive. It's, it's a technology, but if the demand is there and the skew profile is there, um, you can do that. One of the systems we're looking at is 33 pallets long in each channel. The technology can go up to 100, but it's all down to the, the skew depth or number of pallets per skew. Um, we're looking at another one where it's only seven deep, but it's still worthwhile because we can, again, in that instance, we're actually more than doubling the pallet capacity because it's replacing a block stack facility in a 15 metre high building where we're only going 5 metres. So if we can get use that extra height, then happy days. Um, also the technology, the, the communications to shuttles um, are uh, better. Now I'm going to show the video, um, hopefully. Uh -huh. I'm just going to run it on a little bit. I told you it wasn't very... Uh...
So this is um, a crane-based shuttle system um, from Schaefer. Um, several companies do. When I, when I mention companies, and you'll see companies advertised, um, there are several companies doing each of these technologies. Um, but we have the car, which is uh, lithium-ion powered, taking pallets down a track, special track within the racking, depositing it, and then going back at high speed. So um, it's uh, this, this one's crane-fed, so you can go very high and get good storage density. The channels used to be 350 mil deep, now they're about 130 mil deep because the shuttles are much lower. So everything is improving the storage density um, and um, the ease of operation. Okay, I'll just stop that there. Um, So um, the, uh, that's the that's the pallet storage. As I say, it can be fed by reach truck as well. We'll, we'll talk in a little while more about um, uh, automation, but uh, of the AGVs. But what if we could automate the in feed and out feed without using a crane, but just using a reach truck, and still have got um, exactly that? Uh, other truck manufacturers are also developing similar um, solutions. Um, oh, come on. Can't find my mouse, sorry. So, um, so this is a system in... Uh, it's work at this. There we go. Uh, Karai is a company in Germany um, that's uh, a raw, this is a raw materials store and it is a combination of manual, so they've got some manual trucks for offloading and delivering into the store and then they use three automated trucks for everything else to, to um, uh, so the, uh, move it around. So you've got similar, very similar shuttles to what you've just seen but then you've got automated trucks, so manual on the in-feed and then the, the, the automated trucks do everything else now one of the things that must be said if you had a driver on that, they'd be working 50% faster because automated trucks work more slowly. I'm not blind to that fact. So you need 50% more trucks. So it's always a balance between the speed that you need. Does 50% does more trucks mean that there's too much congestion in your aisles? If you've only got one or two aisles, it may, it may not be suitable. Um, so it's, you know, there are pluses and minuses with automation, but the safety systems, the navigation systems, the control systems are all developed and available right now um, for, that, for that technology. Um, I'm not going to show the videos of, of uh, V&A trucks because I'm sure we all know what a V&A truck looks like. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware that semi-automated or automate, uh, automa semi-automatic operation is is possible, um, which guides the uh, the truck on, to its optimum optimum path to the be to the location required. Um, but fully automated, so automated, same truck just with the person off it. It works a little bit slower. Um, we, we, we're examining it on one of our sites, um, on the drinks logistics side, um, where we've got 12 VNA trucks. Is it worth um, automating? 
Um, it's marginal. Again, the trucks work more slowly, slightly more slowly. The big cost is actually in the top one, because to profile check it, you need to double handle it. Okay, you can automate it on the out, out feed and from a profile check, but the profile checking is absolutely crucial. When you've got a person on a truck, they can look at the, the pallet and see, hang on, it's a bit, a bit lozenged, it won't fit in, or you make a slight adjustment um, to make it fit into a rack location. An automated truck can't really do that. It can either, yes or no, it will go in or it won't. And you can put sensors on, but um, it, it does need to be profile checked, and the base runners need to be checked as well. So the double handling element of that um, does add quite a degree of complexity and handling, um, uh, which, which again is, is, needs to be considered when you're looking at uh, automated, automated trucks. But the next technology is, is moving more to the tote side and, and, and what can be done for the tote handling. Mini loads, shuttles, Knapp are going to be talking about shuttles in their presentation a bit later. So I won't focus on those. I'm sure most of us know about mini loads and uh, automated tote stores, but new things. So what happens if you need a, a small tote buffer? Um, you might have limited headroom or just need, so we've got an application where we need a small part store. It's, it's almost too, too small. We need 500 totes for small parts picking. So, sorry Knapp, but it's almost too small for a shuttle system to be cost effective, but we can put um, a robotized uh, solution in, um, which is, uh, this one's from ABB. Um, I just need to move that forward a bit. I don't want to waste too much time well, you can see the whole cell there. This is um, actually one in China that they built, but they've already got two orders for this in the UK. And we've got two sites within KN where we're considering this technology. Um, and it's basically a, a, a pretty standard robot, a very simple gripper, two deep storage of totes, built in a circle around the, uh, the robot. And 400 totes, and there's 300 moves in and out an hour, which is perfect for what we, we require. We're actually considering two of these um, for what we, we need. You can actually build a steel platform and build them high to make use of the, of the roof height. So there's plenty of flexibility in the system. Um, I'll just shut that down because it goes on to the other stuff which is all pick and play stuff. Well, it might be of interest, we can have a look at that quickly. But using smaller robots to do item picking. We'll look at that in a minute uh, on something else. But I mentioned earlier about um, building height and um, as well as the height, uh, again, clabrac has been around for many years is it worthwhile? Um, that's all, so this isn't really automation, except that the big plus um, is this roof camber, because it gives you another metre and a half. So if you have planning permission up to 30 metres, you usually take off three to four metres of usable space for the roof camber, sprinklers uh, and the like. Because the racking supports the roof, you don't need any, the, 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 the span of support is 900 mil, or the worst, 1.9 where you've got an aisle. So you can have a much, much flatter roof because you can tolerate much higher snow loading. So um, also you can go right to the very edge of the, of, the, of the structure of the floor slab. So you gain a lot of space. Um, generally they're considered, over, when it's over 25 meters, um, those can be used. <coughs> Combined with that, you can look at um, reduced, reduced uh, oxygen systems. So rather than fitting a sprinkler system, 
sorry, new form. <laughs> um, you, you, it is possible to fit um, uh, a reduced oxygen system, um, which again saves space, so it increases the storage density within the same cube and is less expensive than fitting sprinklers. So, um, so this is um, so it, 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 the, it, it looks just like a normal distribution centre um, people can go in there um, you can generally go in um, for about half an hour before you start feeling any ill effects I'm just going to run it forward now if I can find where the pig and mouse is uh, there we go because it's quite interesting so it basically replaces oxygen um, with more nitrogen so this is what we, we aim at so um, Anything below 15% won't burn, quite simply, so the systems are there to keep the system at 13.6 and he's going back into the store and as soon as he goes into the reduced atmosphere, the fire goes out. Quite simple, um, but it works. So internal transport, so that was storage, that was, you know, just a look at uh, some, some of the technologies that are being used for storage and increasing storage density. Um, internal transport, the trends within that are really um, autonomous vehicles, AGVs, and intelligent AGVs, or people are starting to change the word automatic to autonomous that can think for themselves, move around obstacles, not follow, following a set path. So a level of, it, of intelligence being built into the software and to the systems. Uh, and we'll just quickly look at um, pallet transportation and tow handling. So a quiz, who can get the link between Zebra, my favorite team, American football and AGVs. This is a bit, well, it's, it's an American video, sorry to any Americans here. So it's a bit salesy and how wonderful everything is uh, in their world. Um, but I'll tell you what the link is afterwards. Uh, and this is on YouTube, I'm afraid. So. they provide tracking systems for the players. We've seen it in football, we've seen it in rugby as well, but um, Zebra, who we all know make label printers, the humble label printer, also have technology, technologies that help the NFL provide all the stats for um, uh, the, the commentators, the people following it online, all the platforms built in, but also they can use this technology within the within the uh, warehouse environment. All the track and trace technologies, which are available um, now. Sorry, I'm not doing this very well. Um, so, how does that apply to the automated guided vehicles? Well, automated guided vehicles, when handling a pallet, could run two meters per second. 
until you hit the emergency stop or something appears in front of them and they have to stop very quickly and then you've got a pallet load of goods on the floor. If you know where everything is, other MHE, down to a hand pallet truck, every person, then you can go a lot quicker because you can speed up to full speed rather than the 0.8 meters per second which they generally run at at the moment you can have them running at 2 meters per second which means you need less than half the number of AGVs it increases the um, return on investment capital cost decreases the capital cost so this technology which is becoming quite readily available now um, is going to be, make a big difference to the automated guided vehicle market. AGVs come in all shapes and sizes, they can be used for towing, they can be used for lifting pallets, um, moving around, um, all different types of things. But the, the, the big development really is in the safety systems, the cameras that are used on board, um, as well as the RFID technology. Of course, lithium-ion batteries almost come as a standard now. Um, on AGVs because you've got to have the, uh, the, the battery life. And the, and the improved software, as I mentioned earlier, means that they're getting more autonomous. They can work their way around obstacles and think for themselves to get between the two points they've been commanded to get. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Arla Foods um, in Aylesbury, but uh, well, it's five or six years ago now, they invested in a, a new dairy site in Aylesbury. It operates 24 hours a day, uh, and they chose automated guided vehicles to um, provide their technology. They've got this whole series of production lines making milk that needed to be stored in skew, single skew lanes. Some of them went to picking to have individual bottles taken off for convenience stores and, and forecourts where they didn't need a full tetratainer of, the, of single skew. Others would go round to the marshalling where we make up trailer loads. The, the complexity of the routes and what goes where and the difficulty of the handling the tetratainers is quite tremendous. I've been to their, sim their site up in, in Leeds and it's just uh, people everywhere, tetratainers everywhere, people walking down gaps that you wouldn't believe people can get between between the marshalling lanes uh, and the like. So, um, just excuse me while I set up this video. I'm just gonna move this forward a little bit. So this is, um, this is Aylesbury. They have 75 AGVs. Um, working in unison. Quite a special design of truck, which is another feature that can be built in, um, just to handle the tetratainers, which are very small roll cages. Um, the wheels can often be in poor quality, so you're not quite sure what you're handling, so you've got to be very certain you can pick them up reliably. They actually have a top clamp as well, which you can just see there and they're building up the outbound delivery. Uh, that's, uh, that's moving on to something else. Um, so, uh, yeah, they have um, 18 charging stations, so everything's designed to suit the operation. So if they need to put more trucks in, they might need a couple more charging stations, it's flexible. Um, the trucks go through a maintenance cycle so they can all be taken offline one by one just to be maintained. Uh, and the whole system came with the uh, warehouse control system software. Um, they can route optimize, so they've got a lot of intelligence, they can work around any uh, other. You can imagine in a system that complex, they have to work around each other, make sure there's no collisions um, uh, and everything. So smaller AGVs, what can smaller AGVs do? So we're seeing much more um, smaller AGV systems come in for tow handling. So Knapp have got one, Schaefer have got one, there's two or three other companies that 
that have them that can be used for towing roll cages. So because all the weight is still taken on the roll cage, if the roll cage is suitable quality, you can just tow them. But for tote handling, um, they're becoming more and more common. Um, I'll just start this video. So this is um, uh, a shaper system. If I'm fine, there's just some reflection on the screen. So I can, there we go. Um, so this is a pick truck just delivering totes uh, into a, quite a simple conveyor system, merges them onto a single line. Uh, these these um, uh, units follow this black tape which is on the floor and everything's coordinated so that the uh, totes just sit on. So the actual truck itself is very, very simple. There's no conveyors on board which um, makes it a lot simpler uh, and everything just follows the path. So fire doors can be catered for uh, anti-collision and then when, at the end of the route it can just deliver onto a very similar conveyor system. So for transportation when, we, when, when picking is taking place um, it's very flexible. If you want to change the route you can just put more tape down, a little bit of programming, a few minutes and it's up and running. So it's very very versatile, can cope with different throughputs and the like. So if we look at palletisation, um, there are lots more uh, applications for, for transportation, but if we just move on to palletisation, then um, everyone, the buzzword at the moment is cobots. And I must admit, I was reasonably sceptical, because for me it's all about speed, and cobots are slow. If we look at um, what cobots can do as opposed to robots, um, they, they can handle, I mean they, they weigh a lot less, 30 kilos as opposed to 2 tonnes is quite a big difference. And that's quite important, because well, what we'll look at in a minute, but the payload is a lot less, can't handle anything like it, they're a lot lower speed, a lot lower reach, um, and don't need as much capability. Uh, to program, they're easy to program. Sorry about the icons, though. That's, well, that wasn't me. <laughs> um, so how can they be used? Um, uh, we've, we've actually done a, within KN, we've, we've done a study of them. And these are some of the issues that we came across. Um, uh, there is still a big demand for traditional robots, let's say, where we have a, a proper working cell fed by conveyor in and out. Um, so cobots, they can only be part of a solution, um, but that, that's what we found from our, uh, our work. But the big plus for me is the, is, the, is the mobile nature of the cobot. So this is a this is an application in Germany that we have, where we've integrated. This is actually a mobile platform with, with a way scale and a computer station to identify loads. Uh, and it can lift, lift, just take off that conveyor and palletise them. If you don't need it anymore, you just wheel it to somewhere else to, to get it done. And I will show you the, uh, the video of this, which is... Um, uh, this is actually KN in Australia, where we've taken that development, to development to stage further. So this is a total... this whole system is on wheels and it'll take about 10 minutes to set up. You can palletise two pallets at once. So you can re be removing one pallet while it's continuing palletising on the other side. So cobots, collaborative robots, they're safe. If you were to touch the robot when it's moving, it will stop. So it's got torque sensors on it to determine any if anybody's touching it. Here we're just setting up an in-feed conveyor it could be a flexible conveyor or any other type of conveyor that you've got. Uh, you can put layer sheets on. You have a series of safety sensors to, uh, well, you'll see it in a minute. And away it 
goes. So if it does detect people near it, even though it will stop, it still slows down if somebody's near it. So you can just leave it to get on with its job. It can palletize two pallets. You come away, take them away, put new empty pallets in, and away it goes. The mast here is telescopic, oh you'll see this in a minute, it's uh, telescopic so it can go up and down to suit the pallet height. Because with these are Euro pallets, it will do a UK pallet a thousand wide. So within our contract logistics world, this has got quite a number of applications for us. You can see the telescopic mass there just rising up to do the top layers. are always smaller cases uh, driven by the growth in convenience, foods, e-commerce, uh, increased levels of each is picking. That really d drives use of automated guided vehicles, autonomous vehicles uh, and more robotics. So we'll just touch on the last two. Um, uh, for full case picking, you can go increasing automation. So you can start off very manual, pick a pallet truck, which is in KM world, that's, that's the norm. But we can look, we're going to look at two or three of these. I won't touch on the fully automated solution, um, but uh, there's several different technologies we can look at uh, quickly. Um, so full case picking, how, how can that be automated? So if you, if you haven't got the, the demand for a more automated system, what's the first level of automation um, that we can look at? And uh, it's, I'm just going to, so there are several companies around doing this sort of technology. This is just one of them. Uh, sorry. Told you wasn't very good at this. So the stack assist tool is, is using a, a software to create the pallet in, in the software to know the sequencing and the positioning, well not sequencing, the positioning of the, of the loads on the pallet. And this saves restacking because everybody knows where it's going to be right at the start. And it, it, it ident clearly identified using an overhead laser which can easily be retrofitted to any pallet picking truck. Um, and it, it, it tells the picker where to put the, the, good, the, the, the case and which way round. Um, it's quick, it's easy, it's relatively inexpensive. It's not particularly new, it's been around for a few years, but it needs to be in incorporated more and more to improve um, both the pallet fill, so you get more products on the same pallet, because it optimises the cube, um, and it increases the stability of the pallet. OK. 
The pick and go is becoming also one of the uh, key technologies that we're looking at. So can the picker just follow the, uh, or the truck just follow the picker without having to jump back on it? It's, um, this is a video from uh, Still, but all of the truck manufacturers, I think, are providing a similar technology. Some of them have wristbands, some of them have a fob that you stick in your pocket. Still have a push button on the, uh, on the truck itself, um, and it will just follow the picker. Uh, so the picker wears an RFID tag, and it just moves along as the picker um, moves down the aisle. So the, the thing to, to note here is the safety systems are there. So you've got an automated truck working very, very close proximity to a person. So the safety systems have to be reliable and work. So um, that technology is really uh, coming to the fore now. And we're, we're actually, as KN, we're actually developing it um, with truck manufacturers to, um, to further enhance this technology. But uh, it, we feel it's a... Um, are going to be a great benefit in the future. But what about small um, parts picking? So moving away from full case, it's a whole number of technologies again um, that can be used. Um, but we'll just look at a, a couple of different workstations um, can be used to give ergonomic picking. Uh, uh, and we can, we can use more still use more traditional um, front end picking systems, good to persons picking systems. But if we just look quickly at um, videos. I'm sure we've all been to trade shows where we've seen robots picking. That's all well and good. It can all be set up very nicely for a, a show uh, where you can choose the boxes and you can lay them nice and neatly in a box, perhaps. If you're brave, you can just have random products scattered randomly in a tote, which is more like real life, and use vision systems to pick them up. The key thing is the, is the gripper. Now a simple gripper head is, is all well and good, like the centre one on this, but how do you cope with a whole range of different products? Uh, what's happened here? So this is, this is, again, I'm not broadcasting KUKA or SwissLog here, but they've worked together to develop, um, well, they're part of the same group now, um, and they're work, they've worked together to develop a very intelligent gripper that can be categorised by SKU, um, so it can start off with one gripper type, gripper combination. If it doesn't work, it can try a different combination on the same product. Um, and using vision technology, it can um, it can identify what it's got to pick up. It can be on a movable platform again, so it's got the flexibility to move from location to location. Don't want to go that far, but you know you, you can see the um, different applications for it. So. You, all the different types, this is the auto store, um, and you can put it on whichever type of uh, storage and retrieval system you've actually got in, in place. Um, another one is the growth of the pick, automated pick trolley. So this is, uh, again, rather than the, uh, the, the, the trolley following the person, this is more of an autonomous zone pick system where the totes come to the person. A uh, number of people around doing it again, um, but this is um, a company called Locus, who, I'm so, this is also on YouTube, uh, I hope. There we go. 
So this is a very, again, there's no conveyors on this. There's only a, um, a, a touch screen for operator involvement, telling them what to pick where. And uh, so, but really a very simple pick trolley. Um, you can put two totes on it, so you pick into to the top one and then you've got the second one for replenishment. Um, it's, it's an American video, so there's a lot of how wonderful it is again. Uh, but you can get past that. The principle of this is really going to change picking, in my view. Um, because it means the pickers just stay in zones. And you can, you can work these as a swarm, so you can make the picker very um, productive, uh, give them 10 pick jobs to do for 10 different orders, and then move forward, either move the picker to a different zone with the trucks, or the trucks just disperse to different zones as, as they require. There's no conveyors needed. Uh, you have scanner, you have a touch screen. So everything's very efficient. The pickers can see where the next pick to do is. They can be dri driven by voice, but they can also see where the robot's waiting, because the robot's waiting right next to the pick station. So there's a, a lot of advantages in this technology. Uh, you can have different designs. As I say, there are only one company doing it, but uh, again, a very good solution. And finally, just touching on this technology, some of you may have seen this. So the, we've had vertical tower systems, carousel systems for many years. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the high-speed version of this. We can do 1,000 picks per hour and store up to 12,000 totes. And um, I'd just like to show this. I know I'm running a bit, bit behind, but... Um, why did that come on? Again, this is on YouTube. So, um, I mean, it's a combination between a tower system and a shuttle system, but the shuttles can move horizontally and vertically. So it's combining commanding ease of movement and a high speed changeover at a pick face. Uh, the pick face can be driven by light. Um, the totes can be stored four deep, so you get a lot of density of storage. Um, and these, these things are just, <laughs> you could watch this all day, I could. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. Um, it's all um, lithium ion charging, so you, you might have seen the buzz bar down at the bottom here to give them a quick charge whenever they're at the ground floor. So it will work 24-7. It's quite an amazing uh, solution in my view. Um, we haven't got one yet in the UK, but watch this space. You can replenish at the same time, because you can replenish at the back of the store, so you don't get slowed down because of that. You can alter the number of robots you put in, depending on your throughput. Got a lot, of, a lot of advantages, but I'll just have to stop that there because we're running out of time. But I'd just like to spend two or three minutes, if I may, just running through um, uh, how to run a project. So I've, I've sort of poached gatekeeper and all that sort of thing, moving from the automation supply industry to Kuna and Nagel to help with them with their automation plans. Um, but very aware that to make a successful system it's in nobody's interest for our best plans to automate and it all goes wrong um, so AMSA came up with a, a 12 point plan I'll just very quickly run through it but plan ahead you know some of these systems we're looking at one system and it's likely to be four or five years before it's implemented big automation project um, it really is that, that, that far in advance that some of these systems need to be, need to be planned um, and prioritise what, what, what is your most important return, cost, quality, flexibility. What do you, um, th these days I think most, uh, most companies know that we need to create a partnership, we need to 
need to work with suppliers and, and the client to get the best out of a, 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 um, a solution. At the end of the day, the automation should last 20 years. So that means you're tied together for 20 years. You've got to have the software support for 20 years, the mechanical support. It might be a little bit different, you might choose to do that yourself, but nevertheless you need the spare parts, you need the, um, the will of the, of the supplier to, to supply to you, uh, to give you updates on the software, to keep it moving forward, keep it developed. You might want to expand by 50% to 200% in those 20 years. So you've got to design that. Um, you need to analyse the data, make sure you know what you want, um, and clearly allow for growth. What are your plans, certainly for the next five years, if not ten if you can. Um, need to understand what you're buying. So I've touched on just a, a snapshot of a few technologies, which are some new, some have been around a while, but all of them have been developed recently. Uh, need to understand the functionality, what's it good for, what can it do, what can't it do. Um, simulation is, is almost a must, it's certainly on a bigger system, but even on simple systems, a simulation can really help. Um, and you need to know what happens if it does go wrong, you know, and design, uh, build a, um, uh, a contingency for if any component within the system should fail. Uh, choose your suppliers wisely. So there are suppliers around now that could do 200 million pound systems quite easily. There are also suppliers that could do £100,000 systems. Choose the right one for the right um, solution. There's companies that, that specialise in tote-based systems, others that specialise in pallet-based systems. So knowing who's who in the market uh, and choose them, choose them wisely. Uh, critical path, path analysis, uh, how is it going to be implemented? Is it a new build, is it an existing operation, which is obviously far more tricky? Um, and be realistic about what to expect. There will be a considerable ramp up time, usually on most systems, so don't be, you know, you've got to resource that, you've got to train your own staff um, and plan a, a, re a realistic uh, migration plan. And that's me doing. I hope that was of value um, and uh, you got something out of it. Thank you very much for your time. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, lots of uh, food for thought there and some stimulating ideas. We've um, probably got a couple of minutes if anyone has got any burning questions for Mike, if that's, yeah. that's okay. Uh, um, if uh, there's anything, uh, anything you want to clarify? Yeah, Peter? If I just give you the mic. Thanks, thanks Mike. Great presentation. Peter Ward, the UK Warehousing Association. Mike, given the given the um, the number of let's say SMEs in this market, and, uh, and particularly in the third party sector, I mean, not everybody is a Cardo or Kuna Nagel for that matter. What's your sense of affordability of some of this uh, automation, and and how in reach is it? for your kind of average third party logistics provider that's um, perhaps two or three levels down from K&N. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You back on. Hello? Do I, oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, thanks, Peter. Um, I tried to touch on some technologies that are quite simple. The SAT system for case picking isn't a big investment. Um, it's all down to uh, throughput. It's down to the manning levels, the productivity rates that you're experiencing at the moment. Um, as I said, you know there are, there are automation providers that will quite happily provide £100,000 worth of, of, of conveyor um, to assist and smooth out the flows. We're, we're looking at such a system where it's 70 grand at the moment, a little bit of pallet conveyor, just to smooth out uh, uh, a, a value-added services um, operation. So it doesn't have to be particularly complex. Uh, it, and again, it's down to choosing the supplier, one that will be happy to, to, to provide that uh, system. So it doesn't have to be your 100 million, 50 million pound systems at all. 
you know, that, um, uh, that final piece of technology I showed you, yeah, it, it's not cheap, but in terms of what it does, and the floor space it takes up, great. And can it be afforded? Could well be, because that could take the place of several pickers. Uh, it's floor, floor space efficient, it's using the building height that you have available. So there's a lot of different things that can be done quite, a, quite and afforded. Okay.